This case study is going to be looking at the impact of a natural hazard and how it can have a major impact on development in poorer countries. The case study we're going to look at is the 2010 Haiti earthquake, which happened on 12th of January 2010. It had a magnitude of 7 on the Richter scale, which is a large earthquake, and as the map shows, its location was near somewhere called Port-au-Prince. Now, as we can see on the key up here, the thick red line round here shows us where the perceived earthquake strength was extreme or very severe. Slightly further out, you can see it was strong, otherwise moderate, and then the very thin line round here, the strength of the earthquake was much weaker, and so therefore light. Now, Port-au-Prince is actually the capital city of Haiti. Now, in this earthquake, 220,000 people were killed. 300,000 people were badly injured. There were 1 million people who were made homeless, and 4,000 schools were destroyed. 80% of government buildings were also destroyed, as well as 19 million metre cubed of rubble filled the streets of Port-au-Prince, Block and Roads. So, what caused the Haiti earthquake? Haiti lies right on the boundary of the Caribbean and North American plates, and there was slippage along what we call a conservative plate boundary. As we can see on this image here, this is a conservative plate boundary where two plates are moving past each other. And what happens is that they become stuck together, and then eventually when they move, you get an earthquake. The focus is the point where it gives way. The epicenter is directly above on the Earth's surface. Now we looked at some of the effects, and many of the effects were immediate, or what we call primary effects. So things that happened straight away, so injuries from fallen buildings, for example. Some secondary effects didn't happen until many months later. So for example, cholera outbreaks. The effects of this earthquake were particularly bad because of the following reasons. There were very few earthquake resistant buildings. Buildings and other structures were poorly built. The epicenter was actually near the capital. And there were very few resources to rescue or treat injured people. And we'll come back to that in, in a little bit later. The responses, so what we have is the causes of the earthquake, the effects of the earthquake, and the responses. And the responses in Haiti was, um, weren't great due to the fact that it's a very poor country without the money and resources to redevelop. It's one of the least developed countries in the world, with most Haitians living on $2 or less per day. That's about £1.30 in our country. Because there were few earthquake-resistant buildings, the devastation was massive. Many buildings simply collapsed or were damaged beyond repair. There are two types of response, primary responses and secondary responses. Now the primary responses were that neighbouring Dominican Republic uh, provided emergency water and medical supplies as well as heavy machinery to help with the search and rescue underneath the rubble. But most people were left to dig through the rubble by hand. Emergency rescue teams arrived from a number of countries, for example Iceland. Medical teams began treating the injured in temporary field hospitals that were set up by organisations like the International Committee of the Red Cross. GIS was used to provide satellite images and maps of the area to assist aid organisations and people from around the world watched the news from Haiti on TV and through social networks. Many pledged money over their mobile phones to help with the aid. United Nations troops and police were sent to help distribute aid and keep order. So these are the things that happened straight away. The secondary responses were money was pledged by organisations and governments to assist in rebuilding. Once that earthquake and all the kind of rescue had taken place, secondary responses how do we rebuild Haiti back up? After one year there were still 1,300 camps, so people still not in permanent housing. Cash for work programmes are paying Haitians to clear rubble. And small farmers are being supported so the crops can actually be grown. Schools are now being rebuilt. So, what impact has this had on the development of Haiti? Now, world leaders promised $4.5 billion to help rebuild Haiti. But by 2012, only half that money had actually been delivered. Donor countries have insisted their companies do the reconstruction work instead of Haitian companies. Half a million Haitians are still homeless. And 40% of rubble is still not cleared. Experts think it will be another 10 years before Haiti will show signs of real recovery. Now on this diagram it shows us a comparison between 2012 to 2009. And as we can see, in 2009, out of the 169 countries in the world, Haiti was 145th on the Human Development Index. 
In 2012, it had dropped down to the 158th. GDP per capita is still the same, and as you can see, it's a much um, lower number than the UK, which we currently get $36,000. Infant mortality rate was 59.59 per thousand. It's currently 54.02 per thousand, slightly better, but still way higher than the UK figure 4.56. So, why were the effects of the Haiti earthquake so devastating? Well, what I want to do here is just kind of compare that earthquake with two other earthquakes. One that happened in China, and one that happened in, it in Italy. Now, in places such as Haiti, where 72.1% of the population live on less than $2 a day, which we talked about earlier, and in cities like Port-au-Prince, where many are housed in poor and densely packed shanty towns that are badly constructed buildings, the devastation is always going to be um, greater than in other countries. These countries have less money to put into buildings and there's less governance ensuring building codes are followed so buildings can um, be built in whichever way. Corruption can also be an issue and so even when there are government structures to ensure building codes are followed there are bribes that enable people to take shortcuts. Put simply, there are the technical elements of the earthquake such as the size of it and so on and then the social elements on top of that. Therefore, the fact that Haiti uh, quake hit closely to a poor construct, poorly constructed large urban area was crucial in reducing people's chances of survival. And on this diagram, as we can see, um, the number of deaths in this dark column here in Haiti was far greater than the Chinese earthquake or the Italian earthquake. And this is despite the fact that the Chinese earthquake was a stronger earthquake measuring 7.9 on the Richter scale compared to Haiti 7. Italy's was at 6.3. Italy being a rich country with well-designed buildings have a much lower death and injury rate than the other two countries. Now this diagram here shows us or puts into context the number of people who, who died. So in China, although a lot of people did die on the previous slide, only one in every 595 people affected by the earthquake actually died. In Italy, one in every 190 affected died, whereas in Haiti, for every 15 people that were affected by the earthquake, one of those people died. So the impact was far greater in the Haiti earthquake. One of the reasons for this is that in Italy, it was one town that was affected and a few surrounding villages, not a large urban area. And in China, although it affected a large area in big towns, it was not a city. In Haiti, in a big city like Port-au-Prince, with so many structures coming down, buildings, this means more rubble will kill more people. The resultant scale of destruction of infrastructure, of government and other official organisations also made it much more difficult to respond once the earthquake hit and had an impact on the number of people rescued from the rubble. So as you can see on this diagram, it shows us the number of people rescued. So in China, um, 1 in si every 690 people were rescued, 1 in 373 people affected were rescued in Italy, compared to 1 in every 16,588 people who were affected rescued in Haiti. Now Haiti, unlike China and Italy, simply did not have the resources to act quickly and it took time to get outside help in. The Chinese government was able to mobilise a very military response, although some parts were hard to reach initially. The resources they had were very impressive. The problem in Haiti was the airport was only half functioning and you had one road route that took a day to traverse or get across. The dense urban environment in Port-au-Prince also made it a difficult place for rescue teams to work once they were there. You could say that the resultant congestion in large cities meant there was little room for manoeuvre, but there were an enormous number of search and rescue teams there, and considering the difficulties getting there, they did a good job. So the task now for organisations is to help the people of Haiti get back on their feet, given the inevitable crippling economic cost of such a quake. And this diagram shows us that in China's earthquake, $85 billion is an estimated cost in terms of how to repair the damage that had been done. In Italy, it was $2.5 billion. In Haiti, it's still unnumbered. It's estimated at several billion dollars. And if we see these red diagrams down here, some kind of proportional circles, if you like, relative to the GDP of the country, although China's is $85 billion, compared to the amount of money that country earns, it's not a massive amount. In Italy it's smaller, but if you look at Haiti here, the cost of repair and so on is what, maybe what, half of the gross domestic product of that country.